I just want to share about some significant experiences I've had in nature and one of the things and the things that nature taught me. So when I was 17, I was uh, invited by one of my professors at high school to work on his ranch in Montana for the summer. And I said, oh, for sure. And my mom and dad said, OK. So that worked out. While I was on his ranch, you know, it was just beautiful. And it was on Earthquake Lake. And um, I got to do some of the ranching, which was fun, like um, tilling the soil and stuff like that. And one day I was taking a hike. Um, earthquake Lake was an earthquake that, was, that happened because there had been an earthquake. It had been a valley with lots of trees, but there were no, but it, but it was now filled with water. And the trees were all dead because they were in all this water. So I had gone for a little hike and was exploring the mountains and the whole thing. And the sun was starting to go down, so I thought I should better head home. And as I was heading home, I was walking on the little trail, and there's like a hill a small hill right next to it. So as I was walking, I heard something, and I looked up, and it was a male moose. He had the big antlers, and he was beautiful. And he was on top of the, the small hill looking down at me. And I, I had the feeling the moose was inviting me up. So I climbed up the little hill, and I put my hand on the moose's thing. He was very high, so it was kind of more towards his shoulder. But um, the moose just sent me all this love. I could feel it. And this wasn't something I had experienced, knowingly at least, in my life before. But I saw this moose send me this incredible amount of love. And it was going on for minutes. And it felt like the moose was giving me tons of information that was, I want to say, unconscious. I didn't understand it, but I felt like I was receiving downloads of something. And then the sun went down behind the, the uh, mountain, and I just had the thought, you know, I should go back because there's bears and things that I didn't know if they would be as nice as the moose. Maybe they would be. Anyway, um, I had that thought, and maybe I did something physical that made the moose do this, but the moose looked at me and then just closed its eyes, like, if you need to go, you need to go. And um, we kind of said goodbye energetically. There were no words. It was just this incredible communion is what I felt. Then I climbed down the hill and ran back to the ranch where I was staying and I ran in the room and there was a man, there were a bunch of them talking, they're grown-ups, and, um, and he goes, what got you all excited? And I said, oh my God, I just had an, a communion with a moose. And he goes, moose? Moose just killed a man the other day. You gotta be careful. And I said, that moose wouldn't have hurt me. And he goes, you better watch out, girl. <laughs> I said, okay. But it was like, you know, that moose knew I was gentle at my soul. My, that moose knew I would never hurt that moose. And so then that experience, I want to say it's like one of my first times of meditating. Then when I was in college, um, I had taken sailing lessons and um, night school for um, – celestial navigation. I did all this stuff because I was kind of obsessed with, stu with uh, sailing. And so then my, um, the guy I was seeing while I was in college, who I, this is how I met him, this is so funny. He was in the apartment next to mine and I had undiagnosed narcolepsy. So I was awake a lot in the night and sleeping a lot during the day. But anyway, when I was awake a lot at night, he also was awake and he would play um, classical music on his guitar. He was a really good guitarist. He made his own guitar and he could play Bach and um, what do you call it? Flamengo. Flamenco. Um, so he was, he, he played a lot of classical style. He did a lot of fugues with his guitar and stuff like that. So it was really cool. So, so I was going, he said to me, and, and we had never talked about sailing, even though I had done it all through junior high and high school trying to get on a sailboat and sail someplace. I had really wanted to do that. 
And then he said, um, hey, it was after the first year of, so I was like 18. It was after the first um, year of college. And I got, um, we were going into the summer and he said, hey, I got a job at University of Hawaii and I'm thinking of sailing there. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> it was something I had wanted. So we ended up sailing to Hawaii. And one time, one day, it was a 15, it was a 15 and a half day, uh, day trip uh, journey. It was 3,000 miles. And we also went 300 miles out of the, out of the way to go see an eclipse, a full eclipse that was mostly in Russia, so we caught a little bit of it. But uh, on the most of the trip, the, one of the things that happened was there was a, um, a hurricane a couple hundred miles away. So the waves around us were huge and coming onto the boat, and the boat was getting flooded, and the sail broke off the edge of the boom. So here's your, here's your mast, and here's your boom. And there's something, it's called a clue, and it's the little hole where the rope goes in. So that, that hole, it had a grommet, but the, but the triangle part of the hole that was connected to the sail had ripped off. So the sail was flapping everywhere. We couldn't do anything. I mean, we pulled it down, but we couldn't steer the boat. And you need to be able to steer the boat in a storm to a degree. You need to be able to turn your boat so you're going into the waves as opposed to the waves coming over you on the sides because that can just <laughs> so he had tied himself in t uh, you know but with a rope to the to the boat and he tied me with a rope to a boat with the rope to the boat <laughs> and then he said Karen I need you to climb up onto the boom and sew the clue back onto the sail and I said really and he said yeah can you do that and I liked to sew um so I climbed up there, and I was gripping the boom with my thighs. You know, I was straddling the boom. And the boat is pitching side to side. And he gave me a curved needle and a leather thing for my hands to protect my hands. So I started sewing. And what happened was my mind got focused on the sewing and the pitching of the boat stopped bothering me. And the waves coming over the boat and potentially sinking us stopped bothering me. And I just sewed and sewed and sewed until it was really secure onto, you know, the, the clue was really securely refastened onto the sail. It was a really, like, I did layer after layer after layer. and. I, when I was done, um, Peter helped me down from the boom, and then we were able to raise the sail just a little bit, so we had just a tiny square of um, control, and then we started to head back, and, you know, we were fine, and he'd been bailing out the boat the whole time, and I never heard him. Once I started sewing, I never heard him. That was one of the first things, so the moose taught me about communion and bonding, and this taught me the benefit of real focus and how that can really take over things when I didn't know what to do, you know, when I was scared. So that was really cool. Then on that same trip, I had a bunch of really cool experiences on that trip. On the same trip, uh, at one point, I was sailing, Peter was asleep, um, I had my foot on the tiller. I was reading, I was reading the, a book by Leon Uris, Exodus. <laughs> so I was reading Exodus, and um, and then I felt, and I had one hand trailing in the water, and I felt something go under my hand, and I looked down, and it was a dolphin, and the dolphin had the same love in its eyes that the moose had, and I looked at this dolphin, and we just had that same communion, and the dolphin was giving me information on some level that I didn't understand consciously, but I understood that it was important. And then I looked up, and the dolphins were dancing to Bach. That's what we were playing on the music. So the music was out, so I could hear it on the, on the deck, but it was also below, so while Peter was sleeping, he could listen to the Bach. And the music from under the boat and from above the boat was going out to the dolphins. 
and they were dancing. It was amazing. There was like, I th what would happen is like two or three or four dolphins would get, they would all go under the water. I think they would collaborate, and then one of them must have been the choreographer. I don't know. But they would go down, or else they all did it. They would go down underwater, and then they'd come up, and they'd be doing, let's say, a, a corkscrew onto their backs, um, four or three all at once, right on time with the music. And other ones were going with the beat. And I just couldn't believe it. And the sun was setting, and it was orange and pink and purple and gray, and and I, I couldn't believe it. And there were more dolphins than I'd ever seen in my life and still have ever seen in my life. It was dolphins wall to wall every which way. So I don't know if it was 2,000 or 5,000 dolphins. It was just so many dolphins. And then the one that was under my hand stayed under my hand. And other dolphins were dancing to the backbeat. And it was just this magical thing. And I saw what it taught me was music is important, fun and play is important, and that they are filled with love. And it taught me so much about the joy of life. And then, a couple nights later, we were now about halfway, so we were about, I, I burned my hand, that's what that is. Um, <laughs> in case you're like, what is that? Yeah, it's cooking. Um, what was so fascinating was we were out sailing one night. There was no moon. There was no, there was no clouds. And the Milky Way was overhead. And it was, I realized why it was called the Milky Way. It was s like sparkling cream. It was so dense. I had never seen it as dense as I saw it that night. And I never still have. I've never been... 1,500 miles away from any light source in any direction, which is where we were, basically. So the Milky Way was there, and we were just, like, in awe. It's so magnificent. It's, I've been in Africa. I've been in places where there's not a lot of population in the areas that I've been, but still, there's still enough light pollution that you can't see it, even though you can see it better than you can, let's say, in Los Angeles, but not like when you're way out at sea. Then, over to our starboard side, there was um, a meteor shower. So all this rain in this, uh, what well, looked like is raining stars. So golden, golden sheets coming down, golden um, stripes as the meteor shower uh, went into the ocean. So that was beautiful. So it was this beautiful golden thing with the beautiful Milky Way ahead over us. And then, I didn't know these existed. I was like 18 years old. I didn't know flying fish existed. But our boat started going through phosphorescence, which meant that the wake of the boat and the stern of the boat were all filled, and the bow too, filled with um, this incredible blue-green kind of light that the phosphorescence gave. And flying fish that, again, I had never even known existed, were flying up out of the phosphorescence. So they were phosphorescent, and they were dripping light on our thighs as they crossed over us. They were crossing over the whole boat. And what I got from that, like the lesson or the, or the wisdom I got from that, was that the universe wants to inspire you wants to show you its glory. The universe wants to thrill you and provide for you. And this went on that whole night for till the till the daytime came, till the you know, till it got too late where we couldn't see the meteor shower, we couldn't see the Milky Way. The I don't think the phosphorescence lasted that time. I think the phosphorescence was for like for about forty minutes. Um but it was just, it was so awe-inspiring. It was so stupendous. And it always touches me when I think of it. I just think, like, the magnificence of nature goes beyond anything I've ever seen. 
And so those experiences, and then I've had many, many more, but those experiences all help me understand the power of love, the power of play, the power of joy, and the power of awe-inspiring creations. And it, it, um, it moves me. If I just think of any of those experiences, I'm just feel filled with this sense of wonder and this sense of awe and this sense of, oh my God. We live in a beautiful world. Yes, there are awful things happening, but there's wonderful things happening too. And I just wanted to share this because I've learned so much from nature. Nature is the best teacher I've ever had. Nature has connected me up with that unconditional love. Nature has taught me to be resilient, creative, innovative, diverse. Nature is my teacher. Just wanted to share those little things because because not enough people value nature. But if you value nature, nature will do everything for you. It wants to impress you. Anyway, thanks so much. Appreciate you. Just wanted to share that.